Hi everyone, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks. And a couple of weeks ago, Wargaming actually sold a balanced tank for gold. That's right, you didn't have to gamble inside loot boxes to be able to get this tank. Uh, you didn't have to buy it in some kind of mission marathon where you had to play your heart out or pay a, a, an extortionate amount of gold. Or you didn't even have to get out your credit card and be able to pay real world currency sounds bizarre saying that right here in 2024 uh talk about this free-to-play title to be able to get this tank you could just get it for gold in the game gold that maybe you got from loot boxes at christmas or gold that you got from competitions or maybe just a very very long time ago this vehicle was i think it was about 8600 gold and i have played it a lot i think i've played this thing about 150 times in the last couple of weeks being able to three mark this tank. Spoilers, I have managed to three mark it and today is going to be a, a selection of games to show why this vehicle has actually some really good potential uh, but also why you have to work really hard in it to uh, to achieve anything. So now that I've three marked this tank, uh, this vehicle is going to go back to being just something that I play to blow off a little bit of steam and not take things too seriously. I play like that in the Char 75 as well. There's a tier 9 French auto-loading light tank, which is one of my favorite go-to tools for just having fun uh, and being a little bit of assassin around the battlefield while also making bonds and credits at the same time. And this vehicle is going to go back into that category. Just blow off some steam. Don't try too hard. Don't try and sweat too much. And today I'm going to be sharing with you everything that I've learned about this tank. Firstly, it has really good HE rounds. Just like I said in my tank review, uh, the 410 alpha damage just revolutionizes what you can do with this tank. The vehicle has an awful gun, 208 millimeters of pen on this 100 millimeter, and it's only got 250 alpha damage. Now, this would be a mediocre gun for like 2014. For 2024, it is a terrible gun. When you think that the CS-52 lease has 320 alpha damage. This thing just feels absolutely awful in that regard. 250 alpha without a good rate of fire. This thing has a base damage per minute of 1,851. It's got awful aim time as well at 2.5, and that's before you've gone into the speed mode where your reticle blooms out. But what I'm going to show you is that you can't just fix this tank's damage per minute with the HE rounds. You also weigh quite a lot. We can go in, and that wasn't a clean ram. They actually tracked us just before. But we went in and we did 269, sandwiched between two HE shells. The first one high rolled for 508. The next one doesn't low roll for 323. And just like that, we removed the entirety of a tier 8 tank destroyer in one go. The amount of tanks that I have rammed to death in this vehicle uh, while I was three marking this tank. Uh, somebody sh who's been watching my stream, please, if you have no life, you could probably make an entire montage just of rams in the CS-52C from all of the streams over the last couple of weeks. This thing weighs 40 tons and it goes very quickly. Inside the speed mode, its base is 70. And with a turbo, as you see me using on this vehicle now, its base is 75. And so if you hit something that weighs 30 tons or less, they are not going to be very well. I've had full health rams against light tanks. I've had full health rams against... E25s, full health rams against a variety of vehicles, and boy does it feel satisfying. And that is where I would recommend that this vehicle goes, into the realms of premium tanks that you just play for some fun. You know, I, uh, not a premium tank, but I love to play my IS-7 or my E50 just to ram things. I like to ram things in the Char 75 as well. That thing weighs 30 tons. For a light tank, people are very surprised when they're getting rammed at 75 kilometers an hour by a, a tank that has controlled impact from my EBR and weighs 30 tons as to what you can do. Even to just change the engagement in a Char 75 to go from, I only have kind of like 1,200 damage potential to I'm willing to sacrifice half my tank's hit points to kind of like pump that up to 2,000 damage potential or against a medium tank like 1,800 damage potential. It can really change the outcome of a battle to be able to remove those important pieces. And the CS-52C, it's exactly the same. It can remove those pieces. But boy, this gun, this potato reticle on your screen, uh, yeah, a little bit awkward. Some of you might want to use vertical stabilizers on this vehicle, but to be fair, it's not really the gun handling that's that bad inside this tank, unless you're inside the, the speed mode. 
But this vehicle has so many problems with its 380 meters base view range. And that means that as you can see on the minimap, I'm not even getting past like 440 meters view range here, even though I'm using a premium consumable film vents. And I've got situational awareness, recon and brothers in arms on my commander, as this is my CS63 crew and I have a very good crew for the vehicle. Luckily, it doesn't take too long to be able to leave the speed mode. It's only one and a half second. But even after you leave the speed mode, the aim time doesn't even get that much better at 2.5. This gun truly sucks. And so the secret to the CS52C, there's a, a combo of things. Firstly, HE rounds. Make sure you use those HE rounds to your advantage. Secondly, you must also use that ramming to your advantage. But thirdly, while this tank's damage output sucks, it can use its mobility to make plays that other tanks can only dream of, as I'm going to be showing all the way through this video today. But the one thing that you must master in this tank is using its camo. By far the most, the best thing about this tank is the camo rating, but unfortunately it's only got good camo when you're not using the speed mode. Oh, that gun handling just, it, it brings me pain just watching this replay back. Luckily, I get an unusual bounce on the AMBT. The AMBT fluffs their second shell, and so I'm going to go straight into the speed mode now, because I know that he's got like at least about 20 seconds to be able to reload both of those shells, and to all intents and purposes, he might have fired the third. If he's fired his third, he's got nothing left. And I feel like in this kind of a situation, where it's a three versus four, and the enemies have now changed it into being a two versus four, we have to go in, take our chances, hope this AMBT is reloading or only has one shell, and just go after him. I'm not going to ram this tank, because I, if he did have two shots and I rammed him, I might not be very healthy at all. And luckily we found out, yeah, he only had one shell, and he's whiffed his damage per minute. And while my tank doesn't exactly have high DPM, his vehicle has awful. And so we're just going to auto-aim and let the uh, shells fly and luckily even with the first low roll the second two shells they don't excessively low roll in fact the second one actually did a little bit of a high roll there and so we finished them off so now we find ourselves in a two versus three against two very dangerous french tanks an elc a borask and i'm with a panther 2. i ping the map to let the panther 2 know that it's very likely the borask and the ferdinand and the elc are going to be coming around the corner in that position although one of them might have doubled back and made their way through the center and considering that i get spotted that's exactly what's happened here with the elc so i wonder if i'm going to fire on the move against the elc i actually decide not to and i think the reason why i'm not firing on the move here is because of borask okay the borask killed the panther 2 and he shot me now the borask has no hit points left uh well not hit points sorry he has many hit points left but uh not anymore uh that's because we just rammed the Borask for 651, and we only took 82 damage in return. The amount of Borasks that I've won rammed in this vehicle has been outrageous. Luckily, I took so little damage there that I'm still able to take one shell from the ELC even 90, and it was very important that I got rid of that guy's hit points as quick as possible, so now I can hopefully isolate the ELC even 90 before this Ferdinand comes through the valley. So let's get into position, find the, oh gosh, Ferdinand on full health, but wow, big mistake there by the ELC. So instantly, I'm going to enter the speed mode here. Trust me, what you don't want to do in this tank is just to sit around outside the speed mode. You want to leave the engagement, reset it, and then either use your camo or use your mobility to try and get extra plays against them. So the Ferdinand came around the corner there, but I think I fired into the, the dirt. I just didn't want to even look behind me in that situation. If I look behind me and I bump into something in front of me, I'm going to look pretty stupid. All right, so we have destroyed half of the enemy team, and there's only a duel left with 241 hit points versus 1,212 to see if we can be able to pick up this Radley Walters. So what I'm doing right now is I'm luring the Ferdinand into a position where I think I can flank him. Um, and I know that the ground resistances here and here on Lakeville are awful and luckily this vehicle has really not that good ground resistances on soft but with the speed mode and my driver skills with off-road driving and all of that i should still be able to outmaneuver a ferdinand this lakeville area it's horrendous it's one of the slowest kind of swampy areas of the game and so right now what i'm doing is i'm just looking to see if i can get a heat round it's one of the good things about this tank actually is the 270 millimeters of heat pen uh, you do have to spam a lot of gold in this vehicle when you're not inside a nice matchup uh, but one of the things that I have to do right now is just bait him into these awful ground resistances and I see an opening. I can make that. I can make that. I, I know how slow he is. I know how quickly I, I, quick I go. And there's my opening. So now all I have to do is just hit his tracks. Okay, okay. It doesn't matter. Pineapple reticle. Just be cool. We can hit his tracks again. 
Okay, we can't track him because he's using a durability device. Or he's got the field mod that increases his track health. He's probably got the field mod considering he's got a mark of excellence. And somebody who's got a mark of excellence on a Ferdinand means they've been playing that tank quite a lot, right? So we couldn't track him with a single shot. We haven't even got rid of his repair kit. I'm going to go in behind him again now. Uh, am I going to leave the speed mode? No, I'm not. But you can still gain full accuracy inside the speed mode. It's just the aim time is horrendous. So we get the Ferdinand to turn around again. And I'm just going to chill in this position. I want the Ferdinand to think that I'm going to come from this way. I'm going to intuition switch. I guess just as a matter of reflex to see if I can be able to get a shot against him. And as soon as I re-stealth there, then of course I'm going to switch the other way. Even though I'm in this like one versus one, uh, going for Radley Walters medal here at the end of the game, I'm still intuition switching back to the AP. Maybe to save some credits, but also I'm just going to ship it around the corner and hope he's not aiming at me. And he wasn't. Uh, and again, we hit his tracks. This time both tracks are yellow damage now. And this guy's got no hope. He has to get himself to a corner and try to uh, to turn. He uses his repair kit finally. And we're going to still stay in the speed mode. A lot of you be saying, oh, leave the speed mode, QB. You'll be more accurate. But in this kind of a situation, as long as I have the speed, I can just run rings around him. And there's no hope for the third man. There's absolutely zero threat for me. So as long as I just stay in that speed mode, it doesn't matter how long it takes me to destroy this guy. I'm not tormenting him, okay? I'm not bullying him. I'm not specifically killing him slowly on purpose here. It's just controlling the situation. And we take down a massive carry here, get a Radley Walters for our 4,900 combined. Beautiful result for the CS-52C. You got to see all of the strengths of this tank in this battle. Those HE pens really make a difference. Those rams... Well, we, we, we basically removed half of the Borask's health and all of the SU-130's health. And then you got to see that the speed on this tank allows it to 1v1 tank destroyers that don't have turrets in ways that other medium tanks would struggle. And I think that in this kind of a game, I think the Borask would probably be worse. I don't think the Borask is as mobile as the CS-52C. doesn't have the penetration to be able to go through the front of the Ferdinand. And also, it just doesn't really have that kind of like sustained DPM. Sure, it has the burst. But quite often in this game, we needed that sustained DPM against the AMBT. We definitely needed it there against the Ferdinand. All right, so round two. Now I'm going to be rolling out on Ensk, and this is a nice matchup for this tank. Spoilers, I'm not going to be showing you any gameplay against tier nines or tens today. Uh, if you want to see that, go and check out the probably about 20 hours of gameplay uh, from, from Twitch about how this vehicle does against nines and tens. It's an okay support tank, but really... Yeah, the tier 9 and tier 10 matchups feel a little bit brutal for a tank that just doesn't have the pen, doesn't really have the armor to be able to deal with them. But the main thing, and one of the things I'm not going to be showing you very much of today, is that really one of the big differences with this tank is how proficient it is as a scout. I've had quite a few good games with big spotting results in this tank. I would thoroughly recommend your second build on this tank is a combination of exhaust, vision system and then either vents or coated optics depending on on how much view range you can be able to achieve but for 80 percent of you out there it's probably going to be coated optics instead of the vents because this thing has poor view range now that build will allow you to play good roles on prokhorovka malinovka muravanka and the only way that i was able to get the uh the 3000 combined average to be able to pre-mark this tank was using that on the majority of the maps even maps like redshire so i thoroughly recommend that you use on this vehicle this thing can get camera rating outside of the speed mode which is very close to the borask it's got outrageous camo its base rating when moving is 13.17 you can be pretty much you can get up to like about nearly 40% camo while moving in this vehicle. And that will allow you to be able to be a light tank. And when you end up on those light tank maps, trust me, you will want to have an extra light tank on your team. But also a light tank that can go around at 70 kilometers an hour, weigh 40 tons, and be able to ram any other light tank and pretty much most mediums, apart from in your like tier 9 and tier 10 matchups, to be able to even up those trades. And that really... Uh, well, th those are my biggest tips for the CS-52C. We can see here that the gun isn't doing too badly. But then again, you know, we are getting a little bit lucky that our opponents are a little bit... Uh, well, they're letting us do this. But I actually say that now. But my hit points aren't doing very well. We're already down to 500. But in this kind of a situation when your west is getting crushed, well, wh what else can you do? You also have to be able to attack aggressively along the east. And this is where if I was in like a heavily armored medium tank, 
I might be able to take a few hits for my team. In these kind of matchups, though, your armor isn't the worst thing in World of Tanks, but it's definitely not great. And I just really wish in this kind of a map and matchup I was playing a CS-52C. Sorry, CS-52 Elise. However, when I'm on a map like Malinovka or Prokhorovka, I wish I would be in this tank. The CS-52C is better on open scouting maps, and the CS-52 Elise is better on the majority of others. But also depends on your playstyle. If you're not comfortable to take your medium tanks and play them like light tanks, then this really won't be the vehicle for you. But if you're someone who knows how light tanks play, then this tank will actually work out quite well for you. So, in this situation, Unfortunately, our western flank has been completely demolished. They're starting to apply some pressure to our base, and so I'm getting a little bit jumpy. But, uh, you know, I have to still try and get this M6 in this situation. Let's see if that M6 reappears on less hit points than when he was. Uh, he still hasn't reappeared, so if he's on half hit points later on, it means we missed his blind, the blind fire on him. If not, we managed to get him. All right, so luckily for us, it looks like the enemy team are just ignoring the cap circle. If they got three... Oh, <laughs> Hey, I opened up my big mouth. No, they've got three tanks inside the cap circle immediately afterwards. So I'm asking for my team to help against the Lorraine, but I'm going to be making my way through here instead. One tank just left the cap circle. That's the Skoda T-56. Looks like the Skoda fired one. Or has the Skoda not fired? And that was actually my Panther shooting at the Skoda. I've only got 30 seconds left to be able to interrupt most likely the Churchill 7 and the Cheeto SP, which is a terrifying tier 7 Japanese TD inside the cap. And this is just so annoying. I'm going to just basically have to, like, let the Shigoda... Oh, look at that gun handling. Awful. I'm going to have to let the Shigoda farm up my team while I have to be able to reset the cap. And I'm looking here for the Cheeto SP. I managed to hit him. I managed to pen the Cheeto SP to reset the cap circle. And now that I've got the tank on the right out the way, now I can focus on the Churchill instead. Luckily, we put a shot in, managed to uh, track him and also damage him there. He whiffs a shot against me. And I'm just keeping an eye on the Shigoda. All right, the Cheeto SP just fired. So I'm going to use my repair kit and I'm going to come around the corner immediately and I'm going to be able to finish off this Cheeto SP. I thought he was in the, the bushes there, but he wasn't. I'm very lucky that the Cheeto doesn't finish me off. And unfortunately, my shell doesn't manage to go through the Cheeto. So this is just putting so much pressure on us right now. This poor gun handling is really costing me. But luckily, the Churchill gets finished off. And you know what? I'm going to leave the Cheeto in the cap circle and focus on the Shigoda T-56 instead. But I've also got like three tanks behind me. Luckily, the Panther somehow wins a 1v1. And that allows me to get a shot into the Comet instead. I'm going to reverse here against the, uh, the BZ-58. Ricochet off my side there. Try and keep an eye on whether the Cheeto SP is going to be coming after me. Put a shot there into the turret of the BZ-58. And now me and a Panther once again find ourselves in a one versus many. In this case, a one, uh, two versus five scenario. The M6 is on my side. The M6 did take a hit earlier, so it looks like I was the one who managed to hit them. But the Cheeto SP just left the cap circle, which means they're going to be coming after me. But I know that there's a Comet. And here we go. One versus five, ladies and gents. The Comet on enough hit points to be able to take a shot. The Cheeto SP once again enters the cap circle. Lorraine has to be the next focus here. Fire at the Lorraine. Don't have time to really aim that other Otherwise, they're going to be able to finish us off pretty much every single time. Now, the Cheeto SP coming after us. We've managed to change our five versus one into a five versus well, one versus three now. And the BZ coming, making their way around the corner. We're going to have to put one into them and just pray that they suck. Luckily, they do. Okay, now with the BZ finished off, he's got 264 hit points. So I've got to finish off the Comet next because he's got such a good rate of fire. So we're going to finish off the Comet. Now we've got to just face hug the BZ-58 and hope that he sucks again. Maybe I can try and just push him forward to try and make it awkward. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be, and we managed to finish off, again, half of the enemy team with seven kills. Uh, not quite a Radley Walters medal in this game, but still a stonking result, including the blind fire. This would be like 5,400 combined. And I got to show you the CS-52C with that kind of like, just, you just got to have like that will to win. And even though the vehicle doesn't have the best of guns, it can still pull off a few ricochets, albeit not against the best kind of marksmanship. Uh, inside a, uh, a matchup like this. So final round for today, and we're in a full tier eight matchup. And this time you see me putting on the sweat. This was on my climb for the three mark. And you see that I'm sweating because I'm also using a vent directive. Now those vent directives now mean that I get up to about like, like 448 meters view range, which will be lovely. A uh, little bit of an extra there. Our accuracy will be better. Our DPM will be better. Our aim time will be better. One of the best things about vents is that when you are playing sweaty, those vent directives are massive because it's going to push your commander skill up to the next level. I believe your commander will be hitting kind of like about 
126% skill now, which means that they're actually going to be giving the rest of your crew 13% extra skill rather than having the 12% that it will be as I believe the Wargaming system still is rounding to the nearest uh, 10%. Unless they've got a rounding error in their garage, which would be unusual because now, uh, with the way that crew skills are displayed, crew skills are displayed to the point with regards to Brothers in Arms. Now, it's not like either on or off with 5% flat. You get a scaling Brothers in Arms bonus, so there'd be no reason as to why Wargaming would be displaying crew skills not to the uh, not to a, uh, a point percentage as well. But I digress. Let's focus on what's at hand here. And that is that we got forwards. We got a few shots on the T-42. T-42 didn't really seem to know where they are. They are lost a bit like the deep there. Uh, but um, unfortunately for us, they've now got a lot of tanks making our way. We're going to spot the IS-3. Going to ask the Kalana for some help. But luckily we managed to hold them back. Hopefully our artillery barrages will help. But they're really not because the... Uh, the way that this slope works means the enemy is going to be very safe. However, this obsidian is not going to be safe from our heat rounds. Unless they angle their armor up there. And I shoot like a complete noob. I get caught by the KV-4. I get caught twice by the obsidian. And I have to admit, I panic at this stage. I fire one shell and I decide to just get out of this scenario. My armor didn't hold up at all. That obsidian puts a third shell into me. Absolutely. Kicks my butt. And I just decide to pull back and go and maybe try my luck from long range instead. Now, it hasn't been that bad of a game so far. You know, we managed to get like 2,400 combined. But in this tank, we're going to need more than that. We're trying to go for our third mark, right? So we're going for 2,900 combined uh, to be able to three mark this vehicle. So getting caught in that scenario, yeah, it's not going to work out for us. So we're going to drop back, get up into these bushes and turn it into a long-range engagement. And this is where uh, playing for marks, this is one of the most important things that you have to do. It's okay to lose your hit points, but as long as you then know how to play with low hit points safely while trying to get, should we say, clean damage. Safe damage. Damage that doesn't cost you anything. That's the ideal, right? In this kind of a situation. So the HWK is pressuring the center, and I'm just waiting for this KV-4 and Obsidian to push their way up. The only problem is, is that playing like this... If our other flank hadn't won, and they've taken a lot of damage to to make some progress on that western flank, the enemies would just come up and they would just manage to catch us here and then it would be all over. Luckily, the excellent camo on this vehicle, and maybe that tree as well blocking the KV-4 means that I don't get spotted. The KV-4 is getting absolutely nailed by my team, and we get to finish them off with the Skoda T-56 also shutting down the uh, KB-4. And the artillery gets revenge on that pesky obsidian. Didn't mean to block my S1 friend there, so I'm going to get a little bit further back, but I don't want to go too far back here in case I'm exposing myself to the other vehicles. But I'm going to go up into the bush, spot the TS-5, see if my artillery will help. They will. Okay, and I see that the TS-5 is not going to heal his stun here, and so instead of firing at the TS-5, I'm just going to advance. That TS-5 is isolated. The only tanks that could be helping the TS-5 might be a Borsig, or possibly the SU-130PM, or the ISU-152 have made their way in. And just like I did to the Ferdinand a couple of rounds ago, I'm just going to go and get in. I don't think I'm going to leave the speed mode. I think I'm just going to absolutely jet it here, and I got you. I got you, buddy. You can just auto-aim, keep along their side, hope that the artilleries don't manage to help the uh, TS-5 out there and finish them off. And um, we also managed to get another big old chunk of spotting there with our artillery putting in a meaty 392 shell to be able to help us out. So this game is darn close once again. We're down by two tanks. We're down by nearly 4,000 hit points. So it's time to see if we can make the difference. We're in the money with regards to our marks now with, uh, with 3,700 combined. But with 7,000 hit points, make that 5,000 as we just spotted the BZ-166 is nearly out of this battle. There is a lot of money left on the table that hopefully we can still manage to make plays with to be able to get our hands on. So we're going to go forwards and oh my word, there's a Borsig in a bizarre location. We're instantly going to intuition switch. We're going to leave the speed mode, which will help our accuracy here. And oh, baby, 436 with 500 spotting. Om nom 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 nom. I am licking my lips over how nice that was. And that's the speed of this tank. I press my F5 key to give an affirmative to my team. Artillery 
really working out here. But our team is still down by 1,500 hit points. Unfortunately, it looks like the Charioteer is going after the GW Tiger P. We managed to spot the SU-130 out in the open as well. Hopefully, we're going to finish him off. AP shell, more than enough for the 38 hit points there. No need to fire HE. In fact, the HE might be worse as if it hits the gun shield or the gun. The AP is going to overmatch in that scenario. But holy moly, dude. There's an FV-207. We're going to go and run around their side. They fire a shell. I'm not sure if it was at me or if it was... If they're, like, cursing the lord above there that they've managed to get caught out in this situation so we're playing a little bit of intuition roulette here right now and we're going to go for the he shells as we knew that artillery fired in the corner we're going to leave the speed mode here and approach them slowly so we've got better camo we're going to pull back behind the bush where hopefully they're not going to spot us if we low roll and um yeah hopefully they're not going to spot us oh no 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 please no and um fortunately yeah artillery doesn't quite catch us so we are right back in this game. That fallback play earlier on, last tank that hit me was that obsidian to be able to shoot the uh, KV-4, to spot the obsidian out, to flank the TS-5, to get all of the Borsig, to get the tank destroyer, to get the artillery. This vehicle really comes alive on maps like this. And now what I'm going to do is, am I going to play as if I was playing Assault? Yeah, I am. Now, those tank destroyers, they could very easily be up in the hills here, but you can manage to sneak up there if you have good engine power. If you don't, it's just really important that you go along the side and you wiggle, and then you might have to reverse uh, to be able to get up. And in this kind of a situation, one thing I wish I'd done here is fire, just to reveal my position to see if they were in those bushes rather than just go in. Because if the ISU had been up there, I would have lost the game. So I always like to stop back there and fire, just to actually make my camo worse to see if there's anyone sitting in the bush because I'd rather that I knew they were sitting in the bush than just to drive randomly into them. So in this kind of a situation, I wasn't taking any chances. Luckily, the S1 finishes off the IS-22, but by far the best thing for us right now is to try and get the Skoda T-56 into the cap circle. I'm going to speed this part of the game up a little bit and you can see I say, Skoda come cap. If you get hit, ping where it comes from. Uh, and I'll attack for you. Uh, cap, please. I can't advance. Uh, but I do feel as if maybe I am just communicating with someone who doesn't care. It's fine. He has the perfect situation. He could have gone and hid behind the BZ-166 and been absolutely fine. But the Skoda wants to advance on, which is fine for him. It's a little annoying for me from a Mark's perspective now, because if we don't cap and they don't come to us, I don't have the hit points to advance. But luckily, it looks like the Skoda's got it all sorted out. And so the Skoda finishes off the Charioteer, and now it's just a case of where is this ISU-152, who's actually spotted on full hit points. Uh, make that now 700, with the Skoda managing to put their first shot in. And again, Tank Destroyer, just, just stay inside the speed mode. Boom, baby, and just keep moving. And this thing, it dances, it dances. It's a fast tank. It's more like a light tank within that regard. As easy as that. A great comeback. Didn't take a shot since that obsidian hit us. I managed to get 6,000 combined. And again, killed a third of the enemy team. Now, let me clarify. The games that I showed today were definitely cherry-picked. Um, I was not having great success in all of the, uh, the games that I played in this vehicle. If I did, it wouldn't have taken me like 150 games to be able to really get to grips with this thing and 3 market. But I can tell you, after playing this thing so much, with an overall 64% win rate on this tank, it's not bad if you're willing to uh, give it the time of day to work. I thoroughly wouldn't recommend the CS52C for everyone. I think there are two kinds of players that will do really well in this tank. One, the player that doesn't care, just wants to go really fast, put controlled impact on, ram and have a good time. Or two, the ultra sweaty player who knows how to play like a medium tank, knows how to play like a light tank, and will be able to transition their gameplay uh, on whatever map they're going to play. Interestingly enough, I get almost exactly the same win ratio on my CS52 lease, but my damage per game is significantly higher. And that just shows that the CS52 lease does the damage with that higher alpha damage, that much better gun, but it still doesn't win more battles because when you get onto Malinovka, when you get onto Prokhorovka, the CS52C 
if you set it up correctly. And check out my full tank review if you want to know what two builds I use to three mark this tank it can just absolutely dominate those rounds. So final, final conclusion about the CS52C. It was a tank available for gold. You could buy it individually, didn't have to gamble to be able to get it. And it's a, a fun vehicle that is also balanced. It's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but it certainly isn't a bad tank. So I think from my perspective, that's a big win for the player base and a big win for Wargaming there. However, when we take a look at how much this tank has been played, it's been played 30,000 times in the, the last couple of weeks, which really doesn't make that very popular for a new tank that you think that a lot of people would be playing. To put things into perspective, the Miel, which is a clone of the Borask, has been played 50% more. And if we take a look at the Borask, um, yeah, it's been played every time the CF52C has been played, the Borask has been played 30 times. Yet it doesn't stop Wargaming from just selling the Borask every week. And so it's really interesting for me that Wargaming will nerf tanks like the Progetto 65 because it was too popular, yet they still keep selling things like the Borask like hotcakes, right? even though that vehicle is clearly overperforming. So the big problem with the CS-52C is that we've got unbalanced tanks in the game. Why would anyone go and play a CS-52C when you could go and play a Borask and you could have just as good camo, but also have a 720 alpha damage double tap in two seconds? Anyway, ladies and gents, boys and girls, that was it for today. Really hope you liked this detailed look at the CS52C and its release strategy from Wargaming. If you did, give the video a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. And if you're watching this video as it's released on Sunday, I'm going to be going live all day on twitch.tv forward slash quickie with a final chance to get drop tokens. And today I'm going to be doing a tech tree showcase on the Minotauro. So come along at... 3 o'clock UTC, it's earlier today because I'm going off to an event tonight to see why the Minotaro is my most recommended heavy tank. Sorry, tank destroyer. Might as well be a heavy tank, let's be honest, in the game. So really looking forward to seeing you all live now. And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.